Hello friends, good morning. It's my proud privilege and honor to have a very, very illustrious chief or former chief of the Naval Staff, Admiral Madhvendra Singh, who needs no introduction at all. In fact, uh, he, his father, Major General Bhagwati Singh, was the first IC number one, first carried to pass out from the Indian Military Academy. And of course, he, uh, he, was a, he, he has an illustrious career, in fact, in the Navy. And he did his schooling from St. Xavier's Jaipur. He was awarded the binocular for being the best cadet, best all-round cadet. He was he awarded the telescope and the sword of honor. Well, he has studied at, he has done courses in the UK, in the US. He has commanded three different ships, an aircraft carrier, a frigate, and a guided missile. We will come to that. We will come to that about his commanding INS Virat, INS Talwar, and his the other ships as well. And we will talk about his illustrious journey. Sir, thank you very much. Jai Hind, and thank you very much for taking your time, sir. Jai Hind, uh, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. And thank you, Ali, for uh, that very gracious introduction. I am ready. Shoot whatever question you have. Sir, your father was an illustrious general. In fact, he was IC number one, in fact. Today, when we write IC number or SS number, being the son of SS of IC number one, and uh, how come you did not join the army? How come you decided to go for the Navy, sir? <laughs> uh, yeah, OK. Uh, you know, our family has had a, had a very long military tradition. Uh, Dating back to, you must have heard of Raja Man Singh, who was Akbar's general. Raja Man Singh's general was my ancestor many generations ago. And uh, we all study foreign generals, Rommel and Pat Peyton and all that. But uh, one of the generals to study is Raja Man Singh. Uh, he had, I think if I remember correct, 22 battles over about 30, 35 years. And he won all of them and conquered from Afghanistan to Bengal to the Deccan. So, and his general was my ancestor. So since then, we've had a military tradition. So uh, when time came for me, of course, my father offered to me, uh, would you like to go and do engineering or doctor, whatever. Those, by the way, were the only two uh, avenues available to youngsters those days. So I said, no, army basically I had at that time, if I remember correct, over 20 relatives in the army, right? Starting from my father's elder brother, General uh, Umrao Singh, and many other cousins and nephews, uh, uh, including from a place called Konadi, General Ajay Singh, who recently expired, his sword of honor winner, his uh, cousin Nar Singh, Colonel Nar Singh, other sword of honor winner from IMA, Rishiraj. So basically, there were a lot of people in the army, and frankly, I said. Uh, Jin Ajay Singh was also governor, sir. Jin Ajay Singh was also governor, sir. And then I was a senior officer's son. I said to myself, if I do well in the army, sab log kahenge senior officer ka beta hai karega. So <laughs> I said, no army, right? Uh, then uh, it was a given that I'll join the armed forces. Air Force, for some stupid reason in those young days, I felt a bit unsafe in an aircraft. I said, no. So I must admit that I joined the Navy by a process of elimination, right? Uh, I, had, I can't say I had salt in my veins. I can't say I love the sea because I had never seen the sea. So I said, chalo, Navy chalta hai. That's how I got into the Navy. So that reminds me of a similar conversation I had with uh, Air Marshal Karyappa. Uh, for ah. Field Marshal Karepa's son. He said the same thing. Ah. His father was the chief and then the Field Marshal. And then if he would have joined the army himself, it would have been a oh, senior officer's son. So he decided ah. to move out. <laughs> sir, <laughs> see, same <laughs> thing. Sir. You sir, sir. Sir. are the shadow of one's father. Oh, one must sir. Out. Yes. sir, sir, do, do you think your son has uh, lived up to the same... Uh, Tradition of moving out of the shadows of his father because being a having a towering personality as you, as a father. I mean, of course, it would be a big challenge for your son and daughter as well, sir. No, no. I uh, my son was medically unfit. He could not. He had oh. eye problem. No, of he, course, no, no. Means of course, he sir. could not have done the armed forces. No, not the armed forces. Otherwise, in life, I mean, having a father who is a towering personality. Of course, he has branched out. He's doing very well. Daughter is doing very well. In fact. 
all armed forces children do very well because a bit of the armed forces uh, rubs on to them uh, they grow up changing schools meeting different people uh, they get adjusted to people very quickly and uh, yes, so sir. i found that practically every armed forces child does extremely well extremely well. So then you went to the academy, and in academy, of course, you were doing exceedingly well. So you were the best cadet, in fact, you, to so to say. And were you also one of the youngest cadets in the academy, sir? No, no, no. I don't think I was one of the youngest. Uh, frankly, I don't know. I was somewhere in the middle. Uh, you see, what happened in those days? You could either join the academy uh, uh, after senior Cambridge or metric, whatever it was, or some of my classmates, for example, they appeared for the NDA exam before the results of the matriculation of senior Cambridge came out. I decided to wait for the results. So therefore, I was in any case six months older. So by and large, I think I was somewhere in the middle, certainly not at the youngest. Sir, sir, you, any memory from the academy you would like to share, sir, because you were, you were doing exceedingly well, you passed out as a sort of honor, any memory, no, no. any particular? Sir. No, no, that's a wrong statement. I did not get sword of honor in the academy. Uh, oh. I did reasonably well. I became uh, a battalion cadet captain when I passed out. Uh, and NDA, you know, everybody enjoys it. You go there as a young teenager and you come out as a thorough gentleman, uh, a man of the world, a good fighting man, because that's what the whole NDA is about. So it transforms you uh from uh, a sort of teenager to a gentleman so i enjoyed the uh, nda thoroughly uh i've always been a sportsman so i enjoyed uh, the adventure and the sports and uh, basketball used to be my game uh, i was captain of the basketball team in fact i studied as you said in a place called st xavier's and st xavier's those days was a pioneer in basketball so for, uh, I think, quite a few years, a cadet from St. Xavier's was the captain of the academy basketball. And then, of course, one enjoyed riding. In those days, we also had a shikar club, right? So shikar was permitted those days. Uh, my father was a shikari. I was a shikari. So uh, I enjoyed that part of it. And I did reasonably well and passed out and made lifelong friends. In fact, we just... Yeah. Called all my dog squadron mates to celebrate uh, the, 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 the 60th year of our passing out. So we had a reunion in Jaipur. We are still friends. We still keep in touch. So that's so heartening to know, sir. Sir, you have been very fortunate to have got commissioned at a time when immediately after that you saw action in the 1965 war with Pakistan, 1971 war with Pakistan. You also participated in 1987 in Operation Pawan, and subsequently in 1999, the Kargil War was on. And so you have been, it's been like a sequence. So could you just take us through when you, about 1965 and 71 and so on? Well, uh, to begin with, my first action I saw more or less as a cadet, right? <laughs> uh, that was, I passed out of the NDA, we went to the training ship. Uh, the, sir, in, in Goa, if I'm not mistaken, in no, Goa, no, in no, Goa, no. if I'm not mistaken, sir. no, 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 training ship, INS uh, okay, that was sir. Well, well before you were born, so you don't know. <laughs> so, we went to INS Steel and uh, passed out of there as cadet. That is when I got my telescope and binocular, and then uh, we had gone on leave, and suddenly we are supposed to go to Mysore as midship, and then we were recalled. We were recalled and we reported immediately within two days. And why were we recalled? Because a Goa operation was going to take place, right? So I was on board the Mysore. I was with the uh, Admiral on the bridge and saw the entire action. INS Mysore was tasked to capture Anjadeep Island. And for that, the Navy had a landing party, like you have a platoon of people or a company of people. And we landed the first boat load and uh, to support them, uh, unfortunately or fortunately, I think the orders were use minimum force. And uh, to support them, of all things, we uh, 
provided naval gunfire support with 40, 60 uh, guns, which are, as you know, uh, pea shooters. And then one boat came back, all shot up. Then the Admiral decided to help with minimum force. And we opened up with uh, 4.5 inch guns. And uh, I could see, you know, one or two shells must have hit those huge trees. You could see the, because it's all forested. You could see the trees falling down. And within a few minutes of opening up with heavy guns, the white flag went up. So that was the first time I saw a little bit of action. And that's the first time I realized uh, that uh, this concept of minimum force, which people use at times, I think it's a whole lot of rubbish. And no politician, no government should ever tell the Army or the Air Force or the Navy to use minimum force because uh, they have to understand that the armed forces are an instrument of violence. There is going to be force. And as you know, concentration of force is one of our principles of war. So I, I learned that very early that minimum force doesn't work. So if you are called in, it has to be maximum force and you have to quell the enemy as quickly as possible. So that's the first time. Thereafter, of course, uh, I, I went on uh, the theater. I'm still in the theater as, a, as an instructor. And uh, in 65 war, we had gone. Yeah, we had gone to the east. And, you know, cadets do a, a tour of the country first on board a ship. Then they are sent abroad to broaden the horizons. So we were actually headed for Malaysia, a place called Penang. And war had broken out and we were still heading for Penang. And everybody is wondering, I think people have forgotten that Thir is around. But uh, sure enough, when we could more or less see the lights of Penang, we were recalled. And uh, we spent the rest of the 65 war patrolling the Andaman Nicobar Islands. And, uh, you know, somebody has described uh, naval warfare as, uh, you know, days and days of uh, sort of boring patrolling and a few minutes of action. And so uh, some people are lucky to go into action. Uh, rest of us, most of us veterans, we serve wherever we are told. So in 65, we, I was there. In 71, again, you asked about 71. Now in 71, I was on a ship called Nilgiri, which was the first frigate major warship built by the Navy. The ship was still under construction. And therefore, those of us who were there on board, we were called to do random duties. Luckily, my duty given was in the maritime operations room in Bombay. Now, if you can't be at sea, that is the best place to be because that's where you're conducting the entire operation from. So I was there when uh, the attack on Karachi went in and we got the code word Angar. Uh, that means it's been successful. Uh, I was in the maritime operations room when unfortunately the cookery went down. I was in the maritime operations room when they, we learned that, uh, I still remember the signal, the CNC where East made a signal saying, I have a submarine lying dead at my doorstep. That was the Ghazi. And uh, so generally I was not, I will not, uh, I was not in the, actual action, but we were serving like all veterans serve. Okay. Sir. All well. So you also saw action in 1987, sir, off Pavan in Sri Lanka. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, off Pavan uh, was, was very interesting, actually. Off Pavan was very, very, very interesting. I happened to be, uh, when Op Pavan started, uh, I happened to be captain of Ranveer. Ranveer was a missile destroyer, which we had got from, uh, from, from uh, Russia. And uh, we were told to sail, and it was a thing called Operation Jupiter, right? And we were said, okay, you go for 10 days. So off we went, and we stocked up for, we were told for a week, we stocked up for two weeks. Our job was, well, I think this, that's one of the first times that the Indian government used uh, uh, what I would call uh, <coughs> a warship diplomacy, right? 
uh, gunboat diplomacy, as they call them, right? Because we were a show of force. We anchored right opposite uh, what is the marine drive of Colombo to show ourselves. And our mission was uh, very interesting again. Our mission at that time was, if necessary, to evacuate Mr. Jayavardhani, who was the boss of Sri Lanka at that time, because the government felt that, uh, this was 87, I think, that since we are going in with the IPKF, etc., there might be turmoil and there may be threat to Mr. Jayavardhani. So, for that mission, I linked up with uh, 10 para commandos. I had an army communication detachment with me. We linked up with the 10 para commandos who were somewhere around. And uh, then we made a plan, right? What to do in case uh, it is required. In case it is required. Uh, and the uh, Although there are lots of interesting things, I, I will run out of time if I tell you everything. But that, that yeah. was, I was, I was there at that time. And uh, we, in fact, we were sent for uh, 10 days. We landed up, I think, staying there 21 days. And uh, ultimately, we came back eating just rice and dal. That's all that was left. So it was a very, very good mission. And Ranveer was a f absolutely uh, a greyhound of the sea. She, very, very fine destroyer, uh, had a very fine crew. And so that was when IPKF started. And uh, then uh, nine, by that, after that, I went off for NDC course. I came back in command of Virat. And uh, when IPKF was, or the Sri Lanka thing was finishing, I was in command of Virat. And uh, unfortunately, that time, you know, we were going through a very, very difficult economic situation. And uh, later on, as you know, we had to send gold to London to bail ourselves out. And uh, so, Virat is a gas guzzler. It's a huge ship. So, the chief decided I, I can either run four destroyers or I can run one Virat. So, for some reason, they decided that Virat now is not going to sail, right? For economic reasons. You know, you have to tighten your belt at times. And then suddenly I was told one fine day, uh, sail to dispatch, right? And uh, you know, warships are always on notice. Uh, in the army, you have people all over the world. Uh, it takes time to uh, sort of get ready. But warships, if you are operational, a small warship has to be ready for war. She is on what we call notice for steam. A small warship has to be ready for battle in four hours time. A frigate destroyer has to be there on eight hours notice for steam. And a carrier is on 12 hours notice for steam. So I was on 12 hours notice for steam and I was told to sail. Now, just uh, since you guys don't know, uh, not, during those four, eight or 12 hours, the ship embarks rations. She already has, I mean, a carrier will always carry two, three months of uh, dry rations, but she embarks all the fresh rations, frozen mutton, frozen chicken, and dawara, whatever it is. And she embarks all wartime ammunition. Normally, we sail with peacetime ammunition. Uh, she embarks. So within those 12 hours, I was told, go. And uh, our orders came in the morning, and at one o'clock at night we sailed. And during those twelve hours, of course, uh, everything's you know the armed forces they work well. Everything is taped. I mean, without my saying, moment this happened, the rations started coming, the bombs started coming, the rockets started coming, and in twelve hours' time, actually the carrier was ready to sail, which was our notice for steam. So I was told to sail, and uh, I was told to sail for Cochin. I said, what's the mission? And uh, ops mission, just proceed. So we proceeded south. And uh, as we were off uh, Goa, uh, the Harriers embarked, right? The Harriers embarked. You know, uh, 
aircraft carrier doesn't keep uh, its uh, air wing on board when in harbor. So when in harbor, we disembark the fighters, they go to Goa, there they do their maintenance, etc. Uh, whenever we sail, they again fly in. So uh, while we are off Goa, the carriers embarked, uh, some sea kings embarked, and then we continued sailing. Now, uh, the interesting thing about the whole thing was, uh, it's interesting for your, some of your viewers, that when the armed forces decide to act, they really act fast. Now, the mission was to go ultimately to the, off Sri Lanka. But for that, I needed a battalion of troops. Right? This I was told when I was off Goa. Right? Now, just imagine how the whole thing worked. I am told to sail from Bombay, proceed to Cochin. At the same time, there is a battalion, seven Garhwal rifles in Pithoragar, right? They are told, move, right? And so while I'm going south, by the time I'm in Goa, the battalion has moved overnight and come to Bareilly, right? At Bareilly, two, three aisle 76s are waiting. So this is the Army, Navy, Air Force, instant cooperation. And by the time I reach Cochin, the aisle 76s have transported the whole battalion to Trivandrum. There the army has arranged buses. And when I arrive in Cochin, the battalion is in Cochin. So that's how the armed forces work when, they, when the need arises. And so uh, I arrived off Cochin. I was told battalion is here. Embark them. So then we didn't want to enter harbor. We carried out what we call a combat embarkation. Uh, we embarked the whole battalion uh, within uh, the day. Uh, I think 76 helicopter sorties I did. I, that, that time was a record. I don't know whether it still is, but 76 helicopter sorties. And we embarked the whole battalion while we were at sea. And then we were told what the mission is. Basically, we were going off Sri Lanka. And this time the mission was in... So now the IPKF is ending. Okay, this is 89, I think. The mission was, uh, uh, well, in case required, you may have to evacuate uh, Indian embassy personnel and Indians. And that means uh, be ready to embark about uh, 15, you know, 300 people. So the carrier is a huge thing. We had accommodation for 1,500 people, which is the air wing and this thing. And we made separate accommodation for 300 people in case the need arose. The need never arose. But uh, we had a wonderful, wonderful time with the seven Garhwal rifles on board. We learned a lot from them. They hopefully learned a little bit from us. And uh, we three weeks they were on board. We forged friendship. Ultimately, uh, the colonel of the Galwar rifles said we must have a permanent uh, association. So the Garhwal rifles adopted the Virat. And as you know now, many ships and many regiments are affiliated to each other. So that uh, uh, the Navy guys learn a bit about the Army, and the Army guys learn a bit about the Navy. So that association continues. So that was as IPKF. Yeah. That's very nice, sir. That's very nice to hear that, sir. Sir, when we talk about the year 1999, the Kargil War, the first thing that comes to our mind is, of course, uh, the uh, army conquering the peaks in uh, Kargil and the Air Force, of course, we had uh, we, we had flight left in Nashikita at that time. He was taken as prisoner of war, but then later on released. And so we hear of the army action, we hear of the Air Force action, but the same way, the Navy action also was equally important and which people somewhere, it, uh, I am afraid it gets missed out, but it's very important to mention the Navy action as well. And you were there very much a part of the 1999 operation, sir. Could you share, throw some light on that, sir, please? Uh, basically, you see, we were not told to go into action, right? But uh, the whole object, uh, the national objective was to put pressure on Pakistan, right? And pressure can be put by different means, economic, diplomatic, and maritime as well. So 
the message was quite clear to Pakistan that if you do not uh, withdraw, if you escalate, mostly if you escalate, then another front will be open. Another front will be open. And that front is a maritime front, right? And uh, the, 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 you know, the Makran coast, the Arabian coast is Pakistan's soft underbelly, right? And a lot can be done there. So we were ready and we made it known that we are ready. And uh, that was done. Uh, we even at times had a bit of a deception, this thing. That time, unfortunately, our carrier was uh, in refit. But uh, one of my officers said, sir, let us put Harriers on, on a tanker, at least on paper, right? So on paper, you must have remembered one Harrier ended on a tanker many years ago, right? So we put out photographs. Then there were uh, some uh, intelligence things, signal intelligence, various things we did to, uh, let me say, to convince the Pakistanis that we are off the Makran coast and if anything happens, we will act. And, uh, you know, basically, they are very, very vulnerable as far as oil is concerned. And uh, so we knew where the tankers were. We knew when they came, where they went. And uh, if required, their tankers would not be there within a day. So, and that would that would bring their entire thing to a grinding halt within a week or 10 days. So the Navy was not in action. The Navy was a show of force, what you call a fleet in being, uh, made, make it known to them. And the Navy was quite clear, I mean, we were quite clear, whatever we do, it has to influence the land battle, right? Uh, there's no point Navy operating on its own, right? The, the center of gravity, is on land. That's where the core battle is. And if the Navy does not influence the land battle, then it's not doing its bit. So our aim was that. I think we succeeded. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So you have commanded ships, uh, you have commanded IS Virat, you've commanded IS Ranveer, you've commanded IS Talwar, you've commanded an aircraft carrier, missile destroyer, a frigate. You've also been on the Hello Affairs at the Naval Academy in Cochin apart from being at the helm of affairs of the entire Indian Navy. So, would like to know your experience as commanding the three different ships altogether and also commanding the Naval Academy in, in question, sir. Uh, yeah, you see, we all aspire for command. I'm sure you in the Army also, we all want to command our own ship. And I was very fortunate, as you said, I commanded uh, after I became captain, most of the time I was in command of something or the other, right? So, first command was INS Talwar, which was a, a, a sort of a missile frigate. And uh, one or two things that I would like to point out, uh, because people don't know about the Navy, right? Uh, in fact, when I joined the Navy, hardly anybody from Rajasthan was going, one or two people. And even today, uh, when I tell people in Rajasthan I am Admiral, nobody knows what Admiral is, <laughs> even today, right? So, uh, there is also a fundamental difference in command, uh, let me put it, between the Army and the Navy, right? And the main thing is that you guys have a regimental system, okay? You grow up in the regiment. Many of you go back in command of your regiment. Right? So when you go back in command of your regiment, uh, you already know 50% of the officers, 50% of the troops, what is the culture, what are the, the thing. Uh, the other thing is that uh, in the army, you, you equip men. In the navy, we man equipment. I don't know whether you know the difference. I, uh, we man, so for example, uh, a section or a platoon in attack, well, one or two chaps make a mistake or they die. Well, there are 19 other guys 
to carry on the fight, carry on the battle on a ship. Because we man equipment, it's an action post manning. So everybody has his action post. Now, if anybody down that chain of command makes a mistake, then the whole ship is doomed. If the chap down loading missiles he, uh, operates the wrong lever, you have a jam, right? You can't fire the goddamn missile. If the chap in the engine room opens the wrong well or something, you have a problem there. So, uh, a captain of a ship has this problem. And the other problem is when he lands up in command, he lands up in command knowing nobody really at times. I mean, I landed up in command of Virat. There are 1,400 people, 70 officers, none of whom I've known earlier. So you have to get down to getting to know your troops, right? Uh, impressing them with your professionalism, uh, your uh, me me method of leadership, etc. So those are the two differences I would like to highlight between the Army and the Navy. Uh, that otherwise, of course, command is command. It's an excellent, much, 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 uh, uh, I would say, uh, satisfying, far more satisfying than uh, commanding the Navy, for example, right? I mean, it's a big honor to be Chief of Naval Staff, uh, highly appreciated, even that you enjoy, but command of a ship, command of a unit is, uh, I think most people will say, more enjoyable. When you, as you, as a commanding officer of a unit, you say something, it happens, right? As chief of naval staff, you say something, so it takes time. Uh, <laughs> it's, like, it's like, as somebody said, working there at the headquarters is uh, like the mating of an elephant, right? Everything is done at a very high level and the gestation period is nine months. So, uh, but it has its own charm. And then the other thing I would like to emphasize, since you asked between the difference, is that uh, uh, as a captain of a unit, you are directly uh, with the troops, you have to exhibit far more leadership qualities, right? Uh, lead by example, you know, you've been taught all the, I mean, I was taught right from the beginning. That uh, first lecture in the subliftment, uh, these stripes are being given to you because they are to be used. They are not to be imposed. There are a lot of difference, right? It's very easy to you impose your will, but you sure are, you're supposed to be good enough to use the stripes for the betterment of the service. Uh, that's one of the first things you do. Then, of course, you were told for every stripe, think ahead if you are in a project. Sub lieutenant has to think five years ahead, to a captain 20 years ahead, CNS 30 years ahead. So there are various things about leadership that you are taught, we are all taught that. Uh, so command of a unit, you have to exhibit much leadership. I would say at the senior level, uh, you graduate from leadership to commandership, right? And uh, there's a slight difference. There's a slight difference. Every leader may not be a good commander. I will not go into the whole thing, but that's the point I'm trying to make. And so, but at the CNS level, it is more strategic. It is more working with the government. And as I said, it's not as satisfying as command because things take a long, long time. And the first thing that a, that a chief of naval staff has to do, which is different to Army and Air Force, you see, we are not visible to people. We are the silent service. You guys, everybody sees the Army, everybody sees the Air Force, nobody sees the Navy. And we are basically, uh, unfortunately, landlubbers. Now, people are realizing the value of the Navy, and uh, 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 we are a maritime nation, and there is no nation in the world that has become a powerful nation unless they had a powerful Navy. So, main job of CNS is to convince the political authority. Why you not only do you need a navy, you need a powerful navy. And otherwise, navy, uh, CNS lays down policy, but the navy is run by our commanders in chief. 
Okay. Or more. Sir, you know, I had the, the last question for you and about which, which, which you enjoyed better as a, as a chief or as the captain of the ship. But you've answered it in this uh, thing only. And it's, it was so nicely brought out by you, sir. It was so swift. Thank you so much for your time, sir. And I am truly grateful, indebted, and honored, sir. I really feel very, very blessed. Sir, before we uh, let you go, sir, one, any last message you would like to give out to the universe? to the youth of our country, to the senior citizens, to everyone, sir, to basically to everyone. Ah, well, basically, it is to the youth of the country, not to everyone. Uh, first thing, of course, always work hard and play hard, whatever it be. Right? Uh, you have to work hard. You have to show your professionalism wherever you are. And of course, you have to give time to yourself to play hard. So the first message, universal, work hard, play hard. Uh, as far as the youngsters are concerned, of course, join the armed forces. That is the message. There is no better service. If you have to work for somebody else, work for the government of India, work in the armed forces. And of course, since I'm from the Navy, I have to be a little partial. Join the Navy. Join the Navy and see the world. And uh, some years ago, when I used to talk to college students and uh, girls and boys, that time women were not allowed in the Navy, okay? So I used to say, well, boys, join the Navy. And as far as the girls are concerned, I recommend you marry a naval officer. They make very good husbands. Right? So <laughs> that is the that message. Is Youngsters, join the Navy, see the world. That is very true, sir. That is very true. As the saying goes, sir, those who rule the water rule on the land as well. Sir, thank you yeah. so much for your sir. Thank sir. You so much. Most welcome. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Jai Hind, sir. Jai Hind and bye-bye.